Welcome to Design Notes, the show in which we find out how the games you love get onto your table. With me, Ben Maddox. In this week's show, I speak to the king of co-op games, Matt Leacock. We talk about how he became a designer and how important playtesting is for him. We also talk about the messages that games can send. If you have any comments, please feel free to pop them in the comments section below. I hope you enjoy the show. So, my first guest on this inaugural show is one of the biggest names in gaming and the person who truly put co-op games on the map and it's Matt Leacock. Matt, welcome and thank you for giving over your time to be the guinea pig for this adventure. Hey, thanks thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so um the first question I like to ask, it's a bit of a sort of abstracty question, but I think it makes you think about who you are as a sort of your your function within the game industry and this is when did you know when did you first realize that you were good at what you do that's such an interesting question because it it, it uh, requires so much introspection um and then i'm wondering if uh i would end up like making it up on the spot um i can tell you some sometimes uh where i felt like i i really did know what i was doing and i think the ones that really resonate are when people talk about how the games really had a, a positive effect on people's lives. Like they brought uh, them closer to their spouse or brought them closer to their family. And that's like really deeply meaningful uh, more than, more than any, like, Oh, this mechanism was really well designed, et cetera. It was like this, wow, this really had an impact on someone's life. Uh, those are the types of, uh, those are the types of cases where uh, that were most impactful that I really felt it. So, so I, I, I do a lot of writing and I rarely know if it's any good when I'm doing it. And often it's only by others' reactions to it that make me think, okay, maybe this is maybe this is pretty good. Is that the same with you? Or when you're actually creating something and you've got that sort of prototype in front of you, do you think, wow, I think I've cracked it here? Or, wow, I really haven't cracked it here? <laughs> That's a really big part of my process uh, is watching um, the reactions that other people have. Uh, so seeing uh, people kind of lean into the prototype and really get engaged or talk feverishly with their uh, fellow players and so on. But I do sometimes feel it myself. You know, I'll be sitting at a table, even just testing something solo. I felt at the time, the first time I was playing around with the pandemic prototype, just a deck of cards and some cubes and actually felt my heart race a little bit when I realized what the implications were of a certain design decision. Uh, that can really hook you in, but um, I think it's more important, to, at least to me, to make sure that that actually carries over into other people uh, when when they're playing it. So what was the journey that got you into game design? Because you, you worked in IT before, and you know, game design is many, many things, but for very few people, it's hugely profitable. So, so yeah, what was the journey that got you into game design? And what was the moment you thought, wow, I can actually live from this now? <laughs> yeah, they, they were very far apart. <laughs> so <laughs> I got interested in game design as a kid, primarily because uh, it was something I just enjoyed doing. And it was mostly to try to, I guess I could say, bridge the gap between my expectations when I open a game and what they delivered. So often I'd get a brand new game and I'd be so excited to play and the games would just be a terrible disappointment. And I had this the sense that I could do better or that, uh, you know, working, um, I, I worked with my uncle sometimes on some early games, you know, how can we make this a better experience? Uh, so I did a lot of um, early ex experimentation, like modding other people's games to try to try to <laughs> meet, meet my higher expectations for them. And uh, it was always just a hobby, something I did in my spare time. Um, it was only after pandemic had been out maybe five or six years and the sales were doing uh, well that I realized, Hey, wait a second, you know, maybe I, maybe it does make sense to do this full time. So that was many, many years after. And, you know, I've been having a, I've been having a debate with a lot of people recently because there is this notion that you should do what you love if it's possible. You know, the idea of you should do, if you do what you love, you never work a day. Right. And sort of, I've been, I've been thinking that's, that that's, it, it, it's, 
for most people, it's not a destructive, it's not a very constructive attitude because it ends up setting up expectations that you're never going to fulfill, really. But, I mean, how liberating was it to you? How exhilarating was it to you when you were able to go, wow, this is my job now. If I'm filling out a passport application, I say, Matt Leacock, game designer. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that was incredibly rewarding and exciting and liberating. I've been working in high tech over here, uh, working at startups. You know, you, you can have grueling hours and so on. And so be able to, to kind of work for myself and set my own uh, time. It's just this great privilege. Um, I do share your uh, your uh, your thinking on that. I think that that can be kind of a um, frustrating message for people uh, because if they if they do what they love and it doesn't take off, then then what? Right. Um, hmm. I. I I don't want to downplay the tremendous amount of luck and timing that that is a part of this kind of thing. Um, I think you should do what you love because you love it, and then maybe you'll get lucky and it'll turn into something. But you know, maybe not. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that uh, that I, I was really lucky and I'm really grateful that, that you know that things have worked out as well as they have. I mean, you talk about luck, and you know, and we we've spoken before, and whether you remember me telling you this or not, pandemic was the reason I got into gaming. It was, it was, you know, I watched the Dice Tower video, I saw them say that this game, and it's cooperative, and I thought, oh, I've, I've never heard of that before, and I played Pandemic, and it was after my first play, I thought, wow, games are this, this is completely, you know, sort of, not what I expected a, a sort of analogue game experience to be. And so, you know, I think part of the success of Pandemic is clearly because it's great, but, but, you know, you talk about luck. Do you think there was a confluence of events that enabled Pandemic to become what it became? Or was it simply that the the game was so strong? Yeah, I think it's a confluence of a lot of things. I mean, I I, I don't want to say I didn't work really hard on it, because I did. I, I spent three years on the design, and I got a lot of input from a lot of uh, expert players and also really novice players uh, and watched, you know, how new players would react to it. I did a lot of research, um, put a lot of work into it. Uh, so I don't want to downplay that, but I, I think it was sort of like the intersection of, you know, all this hard work plus the right timing um, in the marketplace. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it just, and it was also organic growth. It wasn't like there was this moment where I was like, wow, I made it. It, it, it uh, built up over time. Um, so it, it felt like it was, uh, uh, you know, maybe the market was looking for a, a game like it at that time to kind of prove the cooperative game concept, and it just fit that niche really well and uh, just wrote it from there. I mean, we live in an age at the moment where everyone is an amateur epidemiologist due to circumstance. But what what kind of review, what kind of research did you do into into contagious diseases and and, and things like that? Or was it something that you knew about before you approached the design of the game? Well, it was very much in the news. So, uh, you know, I had read articles about uh, SARS and so on. And I had read, um, I think what got me my heart kind of beating about it, you know, excited about it was like reading the novel. Um, it was at the hot zone about the Marburg virus and, you know, hearing the intensity of that and seeing the, what the stakes are involved with, with that. Um, but I didn't, I didn't go into it trying to make a simulation. It was like, wow, this is, uh, hmm. you know, one of many games that I'm working on at the time. And I wanted to... Um, build a cooperative game and it seemed like it was a great uh, antagonist for the system so i did enough research to kind of loosely model things so i wasn't really trying to build a, a simulation out of it so i've been playing the guitar since i was 17 and i'm i'm considerably older than 17 now and i'm still awful at the guitar yeah but I think I'm 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 okay at singing, and I, I I think that's something to do with the fact that there is part of my genetic makeup that says, you know, you're going to be quite good at singing and holding a tune. You're going to be awful at playing the guitar. You're never going to really be able to put your fingers in the right place. Is it the same with game designers? Do you think there's some sort of instinctual ability to design games, or is it possible? Is it possible to learn those mechanisms to become a great game designer simply through hard work? I think it's like anything. Um, you may be predisposed to certain things, and most importantly, you might have a really strong interest in something, uh, and then you dig into it more, and that builds on itself, and you get this this loop where you spend a lot of time, and you can, you understand something deeply, and then you want to go deeper and deeper into it. Um, there's a lot of factors, though. I mean, I, I worked in uh, user experience design and in design 
most of my life. So all these skills I was accumulating over time, these many thousands of hours, many, many thousands of hours were in my day job, were almost directly applicable into game design. So hmm. I think a, a huge part of it is the amount of time you spend on it. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, there's personality aspects to it um, and uh, how interested you are, how passionate you are. Those, those can amplify and um, drive you as well. Um, I, I wouldn't say there's a genetic thing necessarily, though. Um, yeah, <laughs> not, not really sure. I, that's that's my best guess around it. What happened after pandemic became what it became? Because you know, it's the whole thing. Of, you know, I'm an actor, and people will say to me, "Is there anything?" you know, that you wouldn't do as an actor. And I say, at, at this position in my career with how successful I am, absolutely not. I take what's given to me. I mean, as a designer, when you have something like Pandemic, do you then get approached by companies saying, we're looking to make a game, or do you have something for us, or pitch us something and we'll we'll definitely publish it? Yeah, yeah, I do get, uh, I'm fortunate enough that my name is well enough known and that the games that I've done have been as successful as they are, that I, I do get... Um uh, those opportunities. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm able to pick and choose them. So now I, I've been trying to do games that are a little bit more meaningful, uh, to me, um, rather than, you know, I, and I also look at the underlying messages of the games more deeply now than I used to, you know, I'm not going to necessarily pursue a, a game about colonialization or, or whatnot. Um, so I'm a little more picky about that. And, uh, it's nice that I'm able to do that. And when you say something that's important to you, is that, what does that mean? Is that thematic? Is that philosophical? Is it mechanical? What What does it mean to have a sort of artistic vision for a game? Well, I mean, some of the ones that I've seen uh, that I've designed that have resonated with people are fully cooperative games uh, that have some sort of underlying appeal uh, that make people feel a certain way. Um, like, I, I'm not sure I would want to seek out a, a take that game because I don't like the way the the game makes people feel during the, the process. So I, I tend to seek out stuff that um, sort of like scratches the itch or um, makes my own brain light up. And so a lot of those are around creative problem solving, um, you know, anything with a kind of creative element to it. Uh, so deck building games are, are really, I love those because you can kind of like design as you're playing. Um, and uh, like, I, like I mentioned, uh, I, I, lo I love Pandemic because it, it featured this group dynamic uh, creative problem solving in real time that I really enjoyed. So it would be remiss of me if I didn't ask you this question, the designer of Pandemic, right? And you, I'm sure you'll have a view on it. Every so often on the board game forums, on social media, you will have the alpha player debate. And people will say, alpha players don't exist, or yes, games like Pandemic don't do enough to limit the concept of an alpha player, or... How do you stop an alpha player in a co-op game? What's your view on that? And what's your what's your view on the notion of the alpha player? And how does someone combat it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, this sort of play personality certainly exists. People uh, can play these types of cooperative games and be very domineering. Um, and I would say that, yes, uh, I'd say absolutely Pandemic does not do enough to address that. Um, but I would also say at the same time, I, you know, I... I also don't think it's necessarily the game's job to do that. Um, and I, I want to go a little deeper in that. In that hmm. That's a, a personality uh, issue, I think, more than anything. So my, my, uh, my suggestion would be, hey, don't play with people that uh, are domineering, right? Um, in the same way, I might suggest to a chess player, if you're a novice, you may not want to seek out a grandmaster for your first game to try to challenge, right? You want to find... Um, people that are appropriate to play any game with. Uh, so, you know, cooperative games may not be the best, uh, or certain titles may not be the best fit for uh, different groups of people. So I think it's more like a, a personality thing that you should be frank about and, and work through. Uh, because if you try to, if you try to solve the problem as a, a game design problem, you're, you're never really going to be able to solve it. 100%. Um, you can put all sorts of different mechanisms in there. You can have hidden information. You can have a hidden trader. You can have conflicting goals. Um, there's many different things you can put in there, but it changes the nature of the, the game. And so if you want to have uh, a perfect information, collaborative problem solving experience, you can't do that, right? I mean, so I, I feel like they're mutually exclusive. And the best way forward is really to 
um, set expectations and and, and uh, suggest that players seek out uh, those other players that are most appropriate for them to play with, rather than try to do this heavy-handed thing where you put all these obstacles in the way of people in order to to combat the problem. Because there are, there are true costs in that, if that makes sense. So I want to talk now, I want to go on about your game design process, how something goes from an intangible idea in your head to the kind of things that people get on the table and have experiences. So can you give us a, just just before we dig deeper into it, just a brief kind of overview of, of the, your process of getting a design from idea to reality? Yeah, uh, so I generally start in a notebook and <laughs> sketch out some ideas relatively quickly. And um, this is generally in response to some idea or opportunity or itch that I've got. Um, so uh, the first the first impulse is to kind of get it out on paper quickly. And uh, the games don't spend much time there. Uh, they need to get sort of into a rough prototype form very, very quickly. So um, assuming I've got some sort of goal in mind, and it, it's helpful to write that down so that you're, you're not constantly moving the, the goal around or the objective around. Assuming I've got that kind of jotted down, like here's sort of what the pitch is around the game. Uh, the first step is really to get into a rough prototype. And uh, that I generally kind of tinker around with myself just to see if I can find a, a core game, something that uh, sort of like the, 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 the center of it, the, the beating heart. But sometimes it's just the, the, the turn-based structure or the, the core loop that people talk about, um, a rough idea there. And I'm um, basically looking for anything that generates any kind of emotion or, uh, yeah, I think I think it's probably a, like the emotional core of the game. Is there something that I'm doing that, that scratches some sort of itch? It doesn't have to be fun. It can just be some other type of emotion. Hmm. And uh, the next step there is to try to build it out into a semi-playable game. And I'll, I'll often try to get uh, other players to, to help out with. And this is generally like people that are close to me. Um, people who are willing to, to tinker around with the game for its own sake, for the uh, just to get the process sort of unlocked. It's not about having fun at all, uh, because it, this this period can be pretty brutal and and satisfying as a as a player. Um, and then that generally, uh, you know, if it makes it out of that stage, uh, the next step is to get a, a a game that's playable from start to finish. Uh, so the games generally take a long time in that in that um, period, and and that's about refinement and and really understanding where the boundaries of the game are. Um, so balance comes in there and, um, throughout that process, I'm gradually kind of like pulling myself out. Uh, so I start playing it and then I'm observing in the same room and ultimately I'm just watching, um, recordings of people playing it. I'm not even in the room. Yeah. So, um, I was speaking to someone about you the other day. I was talking about sort of the process of game design and they were talking about you and your attitude towards playtesting in that you watch an awful lot of games and you video a lot of people playing games. What is your relationship with your playtesters? Um, it's a variety. So early playtesters tend to be people that I've gone to in the past and trust, and I, I kind of have an idea what I'm going to get from them, and they have an idea what, what to expect when they get a prototype. Um, I try to find uh, groups that are pretty representative of who I want to be playing the game when it's when it's out early on. Uh, target that real core group. Um, sometimes I'll be topical games um, for hobbyists. And you know I'll try to find people that are right dead center in that, uh, that bullseye. You know, people are interested in the topic and interested in games. Um, but then again, you know, gradually widen that circle out. So um, I might get people who are just hobby gamers or people that are just interested in the topic. And then even looser than that, people who maybe interested in games in general, but I've only played mass market games. Uh, it, it very much depends on the, the, the title. But I'll do, a, it's fairly loose screen early on, generally speaking, as people that I know and trust, and then going wider from that. So then it may be friends of friends, or, or people that I know are interested in the topic that I don't know, uh, so I can get blind reviews that way, or people are interested in um, games um, that I don't know. So conventions are really helpful in that regard. It's good to, to, to network and, and get people just to sit on a table. I've never met them before, you know, give them the pitch and, and get them into the game and, and see how they react. But uh, really aim for diversity as well. So I think Pandemic actually, um, part of it, the reason it was as successful as it was is that I just played it with so many different types of folks and got feedback from lots of different angles, whether it was like, um, other professional game designers or you know my mom it was it, it was all over the board 
And so, are you interested in the are you interested in the direct feedback of the playtester? Them saying, "I don't think this works. I think this works," or are you interested in witnessing their reactions to certain things and then? you yourself as a game di- designer saying, oh, okay, I see that that's good and I see that that isn't. Yeah, it's very much the latter. I mean, early on, I would ask people at the end of a, you know, back, back when I was working on my earliest games, it was, you played the game and you'd ask people, what did you like? <laughs> you know, and what would you change? I don't do that at all, really, anymore. Now it's really observing to see what other people's experiences are. And then uh, if they're fairly articulate in games, oh, what problems did you see? You know, I'll, I'll observe a lot and they won't recount a lot of the problems that they've had because it's unconscious. They're like, oh, whatever, it was in the rule book. And I'm feverishly scribbling down, scribbling down. they had to check the rule book, right? Because I, I consider that a failing. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it. I, I don't look to my play testers to provide solutions. Um, I, I think they can articulate uh, problems sometimes, and they can almost always uh, tell you how they're feeling. And it's important to to uh, watch watch for that. And then if they tell you that, you know, believe them. They people generally know right. sort of what they're feeling. That's legitimate. You can't say, well, you, you don't feel like that. <laughs> you can't really argue with that. <laughs> and so. You know, you most famously, you've worked with other game designers, but most famously you worked with Rob Davio on the Pandemic Legacy series. How does your process change when another designer comes into the mix? You know, it doesn't change a whole lot. It's it's enriched, I think, more than anything. I mean, one thing that, that immediately um, happens is that you have to communicate with your co-designer, which means you have to write things down in many cases. Um that happens a lot with me because I, I'm often working with co-designers in other time mm-hmm. zones, and we, we just can't be doing video nonstop. So um, one thing is we'll, we'll have like regular check-in meetings uh, over video to, to discuss um, design concepts and really get on the same page and talk about problems and solutions at a, a high level. But then we'll o- often go off into our corners and do independent work and then come back and sync up. When we're, um, we have to communicate with each other a lot, um, often there's a lot of journaling involved and that forces you to kind of like uh, really understand what's going on. Uh, you can't just sort of like intuitively go through the process. You have to articulate it to someone else. So you have to articulate it to yourself first. So I think um, the process gets a little bit more spelled out. Um, I feel like I know what I'm doing a little bit more and there's less mm-hmm. guesswork and it's harder for me to sweep problems under the rug because I have to write them down for other people. So that's one thing, uh, just a lot more communication and um, being more deliberate about things because you have to, be, both people have to be on the same page. And and were you and Rob put together by Z-Man or was it you met at a convention over a cup of coffee and he said, I've got this great idea. I mean, what was the process of getting together for Pandemic Legacy? Uh, the idea for Pandemic Legacy came out of a brainstorm of the publisher. Uh, it was F to Z at the time. Um, and we were thinking of all the different ways we could what we could do with pandemic uh we did a dice game before you know should there be a card game should there be a legacy game ha ha <laughs> so i kind of laughed it off initially <laughs> uh but then i started sketching a couple ideas down in a notebook and quickly filled a couple pages and i'm like oh my god this would be amazing <laughs> so i did ask um i don't remember this but rob tells me that uh i think z-man uh, gave me rob's uh contact information so mm-hmm. i simply I wrote a simple pitch to him over email, probably just a handful of sentences, and he wrote back with a single word, yes, <laughs> really big type. <laughs> and then we just started working right after that. And and this is a question, so it, it's close to the question where, you know, if you're doing something, if you're doing something, you do you have a feeling whether it's good or not? When you're doing something, do you have, so so Pandemic Legacy, for instance, did you know it was going to be the raging hit that it became. We had some ideas that people were really going to enjoy it because we saw really high engagement from the playtesters um, and excitement there. But you really never, you know, I don't know. It, it's too much to to expect that something would be as as uh, big as it was. That what that was a surprise. Uh, that was amazing. Just watching it climb the charts on BGG, for example, over the first few months. That was just mind blowing. Um, I think we had an idea that people were really going to like it, but we didn't really know how big it would be at all. I mean, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, how important for you is something like the regard for your game on BGG? 
Yeah, I mean, it's funny because uh, BGG tends to like a certain kind of game. You know, games that um, that are more expensive and a little more complex tend to do well because, you know, it attracts a certain segment, a segment of the audience that are really into it. And uh, the other people who don't feel like they're part of that pool don't get in the pool. And so there's a self-selection bias and all this. I try not to get too hung up on it. Um, but it is fun to kind of see this stuff uh, uh, get talked about and, and see what, what the players uh um, find rewarding in them and not but uh, yeah I try not to dwell too much on the comments for example it's just a it's not good for the psyche <laughs> <laughs> so you know you're a you're a veteran of the industry now I think it's fair to say and you've published a lot of games do you still get you know this is coming from me someone who's had nothing published a game or book or anything right so when you get that author copy through the post and you open the box and you see the cover art and you see your name and you see, you know, the, the title of the game, do you still get that sort of electric thrill that you would have done when you first had a game published? I can tell you, I'm getting all tingly right now with you just saying that. So yeah, it's still magical when they show up on the doorstep. There's uh, there's one that's pending release right now that I just I just can't wait to get my my hands on. So yeah, it still still has a lot of magic. So going on to that, then what do you have that you can talk about? Of course, what do you have that's coming out into the future that we can enjoy? Uh, well, I can say that there are more hot zone um, editions planned and in the pipeline. Um, I can't say which ones yet, but uh, yeah, look look for more pandemic hot zone. It's sort of like a, a smaller scale down, uh, I don't know, bite size uh, version of pandemic. Um, so look for more of that. I'm trying to think what else I can talk about. Um, well, I, uh, I'm working on a climate game uh, with Mateo mm -hmm. uh, Menapace. I've been working on that almost for a year now. And uh, that's been quite a journey um, because it's involved just so much research uh, up front. And then unlike pandemic where I, you know, I, I had a cursory knowledge of how, like how virology worked and so on. In this one, we really want to get the science right. So it's, it's meant a lot of, uh, a lot of reading, a lot of note taking, a lot of consulting with experts and so on. And then that further uh, challenge of um, trying to both model uh, what's going on and also make it emotionally engaging and a fun game mm. at the same time. Um, that's, uh, that's been a real, real challenge. Um, rewarding, but uh, yeah, boy, that's that's hard. Um, I think that's. I'm looking over my whiteboard right now. I think that's about all I can actually publicly announce right now. But there's there's plenty more coming. And so, um, you know, you're you're making a climate game, and I assume that the part of it is trying to draw people's attention to issues to affect change. Do you think games can do that? Uh, yeah, I think they. I think they can in the same way that uh, I know that I've I've been affected by literature, uh, you know, and the, the the reading I've been doing on climate. I think actually playing a game where a lot of that stuff is modeled out, um, where you actually make decisions uh, that can affect possible futures, could be even more impactful uh, because you can. It's like a little petri dish. You can experiment and see where your decisions will lead and try different strategies and so on. And that's part of the reason why we want to get the modeling um, in the ballpark so that you can have an idea of what certain solutions uh, do um, in this sort of system and understand the dynamics behind it. And it's my hope that uh, by playing this, you can kind of wrap your head around um, the problems and solutions a little bit better. Because when I started doing the research, I, I really had this rough understanding of what was going on. and all that uncertainty was kind of crippling. It, it, it leads to uh, a feeling of helplessness and despair in some cases for some people. Mm -hmm. Certainly that was sure. my, my feeling. And so it's my hope that by playing this, you can kind of see, oh, you know, here, here are some of the potential solutions. Here's how that kind of stuff would play out over time. And here's how, you know, even how I could make a difference if I wanted to. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a lot to kind of lay out <laughs> as a goal. But um, I've got this platform now, you know, with um, Pandemic coming out, I can, I can do this follow on. Mm. It seems like a, a great opportunity and I don't want to squander it. So I've got a scenario for you. Conventions are back on again. You go to a, you, you work at the convention all day, you go to a bar and you, you go to the toilet and you're walking back from the toilet and you hear your name spoken by a group of gamers sat at a table. And so you sort of sidle into the corner and eavesdrop. And they're talking about you as a designer and your work. 
what do you hope that they're saying about you? <laughs> well, I guess I would hope it was it was positive things. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, over and above that, I, I'm not sure I have any specific. Um, let me think about that. Uh, that you know, I guess I, I I would hope that people would would say that I was being mindful and uh, uh, thinking critically about the types of work I was I was doing, and that that it uh, engaged them, and that uh, they had a enjoyable time, or it um, helped them emotionally connect to other people. Because uh, I I've heard those stories before, and I just love hearing that. Um, so yeah, I mean, more than anything, just just I would hope that they weren't trashing this stuff. Although uh, that is kind of fun sometimes too. <laughs> uh, I've had experiences where I've been in game stores where people have been talking about my stuff while I've been in the aisle, and uh, I just enjoy, enjoy being able to listen in on that and not necessarily uh, interrupt them. So one final question then, and this is this is a big question. You can choose to answer it in any which way you you wish. Why is gaming good? Uh, well, I think, um, let's see, I think games present this uh, this opportunity for you to sit around uh, in a social space with people, other people, and uh, connect with them over, it sort of like provides this context for conversation in many cases. Um, we spend so much time you know, connecting with our computers and, and doing things digitally that I think that has a, a way of disconnecting you from other people and... Um, I think uh, you know you can think of like these board games as being like, like a social lubricant or a, a way of um, providing a context for people to interact with each other. That's not confrontational necessarily. I mean, that's one thing that cooperative games are good at. Uh, but even competitive games, you know, you're, you're you're interacting together in a shared space, and what you do within that, you know, quote magic circle is is protected, and um, it's a place where you can experiment both socially and also kind of work through. Um, uh, different problems and um it's a place to be playful with other people and enjoy time with other people so uh, i think that's really valuable i think that may be part of the reason why board games have, have seen so much success for the past uh, 10 20 years is that people really need that kind of opportunity to to interact with other folks in a face-to-face -face setting um so that's that's the first thing that comes to mind it's just this this way that it connects people across a, a shared space Brilliant. Well, Matt Leacock, thank you ever so much for giving over your time. And I, I must confess, I'm really looking forward to the to the climate change game. Oh, thank you. Th thanks for having me as well. <laughs>